Hey, everybody. This is a great crowd. I'm really excited about this. This is fantastic. Thank you all for coming out at 7.30 on a Sunday night. We really appreciate that. Um, so uh, we're here to, um, to learn about what is happening in the United Methodist Church. Um, this really kind of got uh, prompted due to um, people who were saying, you know, hey, um, I understand that... Um, um, you know, things are happening over in my mama's church or at, you know, my friend's church, that kind of thing. Um, what are, what's happening here at Wrightsville? And, um, and so I, I thought, well, you know, it might be good for all of us to come together and just kind of learn what, what is going on. Um, kind of the, uh, the, the, the first thing probably people need to know is, is that uh, there was supposed to be a general conference in 2020, and that got postponed due to COVID, and things have just kind of changed a lot dramatically since then. Um, and we're going to hear we're going to hear about that from our panelists, um, who will fill us in on, on everything. But let's begin with a moment of prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, Lord, we thank you for this uh, great day, a great day to start the week, a day of worship and rest and play, and now a time of information. And Father, I pray that you will bless our gathering this evening, Lord, that um, we might uh, be open to your voice um, speaking to us anew. Lord, I understand that as we gather here today that we are not all of the same mind on uh, many of the issues that are being discussed, but Lord, I pray that we would be of one heart and that we might love um, as you love us. Lord, I ask, um, Father, that we would continue to, um, to follow your lead, and, um, and Lord, that you will just help us to uh, understand uh, what is best and what is your will. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, I'm super excited um, to introduce our three panelists tonight, who um, some of you may know very well. Um, Reverend Carol Gehring was our pastor here at Wrightsville from 1985 to 1996. And how many times did you go to General Conference? Five. She's a five-time delegate to General Not Conference. Not a delegate every time, an alternate son. A delegate or an alternate, okay. Um, five times to General Conference. So she's, she's one of the people who votes on the denominational issues that affect the United Methodist Church worldwide, okay? Um, all right, and then um, in the middle is my wife, Tara Lane, and she serves as the Harbor District Superintendent, and um, she's spending a lot of her time these days um, dealing with um, issues around, um, around churches that um, may want to separate from the United Methodist Church. And you know Pastor Julia, um, and uh, I don't know that I need to really introduce her. We, uh, she just preached here this morning. Um, so uh, anyway, um, but uh, you know, she's on staff with us as our associate um, and uh, you know, a recent graduate of uh, Duke Divinity School and Belmont University. And um, anyway, um, so the three of them are gonna help us um, with our, um, our questions tonight. And I have asked each of them um, to, to prepare for this evening with a specific role in mind. And so I, I've asked Carol if she would give us a bit of a history lesson that explains why there is such debate and division within the United Methodist Church today. Um, do you want me to throw you the topic or do you want me to tell, tell a little bit about, about all of that? I'm glad to do it. Okay, yep. all right, we'll just turn things straight over to Carol. All right, okay. thanks everybody. Let's welcome Carol and Tara and, and Julia. <laughs> Thank you. It's great to be with you tonight, and I'm standing because I can see you better, and I maybe can be seen better, but it's great to be with you tonight. I am Carol Gehring. I've served here at this church, but it was a very different time and circumstance then, and it was during those years that I was beginning to attend general conferences. More about that in a moment. What I wanted to tell you, though, is I'm also what you'd call a cradle Methodist. I was born to parents who were a part of a Methodist church, and so from the earliest of years, I was participating in Sunday school and children's choir and learning, Jesus loves me, this I know. Why? For the Bible tells me so. Never questioned it, never debated it. And it was from that point that I grew up in the faith and experienced, like most kids, sitting in church and learning through the hymns and through the liturgy and through the practices that I engaged alongside parents, friends, neighbors, and a few looking down their noses at me, 
like that behavior is not quite up to par, if you know what I mean. So I had formative experiences in the United Methodist Church. And then when I was in high school, I would have to say that my faith was um, growing much more quickly through an evangelical ministry called Young Life. And a number of you would know about Young Life. My involvement with Young Life was so exciting and gratifying that I went into college and volunteered to be a Young Life leader, which I did for the years that I was in school, and really felt the stirrings of a call to ministry through that work, as well as some other occurrences. And eventually, when I went into ministry, it was with an open mind toward denominations. In other words, through the years of late high school, college, and then entering into divinity school, I was exploring. I was looking around, checking it out, listening deeply for what other denominations teach and believe and where the practices of that tradition might differ from the Wesleyan tradition with which I was most familiar. And I discovered, much to my surprise, a love for the United Methodist tradition. And what was it? Well, what drew me back, among other things, was the teaching of, about grace. We are creatures of a gracious God, a grace that's not deserved or earned. And I had been shown a whole lot of grace in my lifetime. I also came to appreciate very deeply, uh, as I said, the hymns of the church, which for me were a, a teaching tool and really did kind of get into your bones and made me understand better what I was reading in scripture and what I was understanding about our faith. And I would say the other thing that really was impressive to me was Wesley's emphasis on personal and social holiness that we are people not just in a relationship with God individually, but that we have responsibilities to the community around us. And I had a lot of time, as I said, to explore, and this is where I fell in love with the church again. I bring you now to the where did this begin for us as United Methodist believers? Well, over 2,000 years of Christian church history, several issues have threatened the unity of the church. For example, early in the years of Christian, the Christian movement, who's eligible for baptism and membership in the church? Only Jews? Or could Gentiles be accepted as well? How will the church be organized and governed? We may agree that Christ is the head of the church, but do we also need to look to a human figurehead like a pope? That was an issue that divided the Roman Catholic and the Eastern Orthodox Church. Do we believe in the priesthood of all believers, as is more common in the uh, Protestant faiths? Then we had division at times when we were struggling through years of slavery, war, human rights, the role of women in the home, in the community, and in the church. So the issue of human sexuality, while it is proving to be very thorny, it is, I think, not unlike some of the other issues that have been uh, raised in the church and have been the expression of concern, maybe is putting it too lightly, but has been for some congregations a dividing line. I don't think it'll be the last one that we debate either. But it begs the question for me, can we yet engage in prayerful, respectful conversation about issues, all kinds of issues, and remain united in faith and love? Well, ironically, ironically, the United Methodist Church was formed in 1968 where, uh, when like-minded Christians of two denominations merged into one that became the United Methodist Church. There were the Methodists, tracing their roots back to the 18th century England and the work of Anglican priests, John and Charles Wesley. This group merged with 
the Evangelical United Brethren, and the founding fathers and mothers of the EUB were Mennonite and German Reformed, with ties to Philip William Otterbein and uh, Martin Boehm and Jacob Albright. And all of these came together to form the United Methodist Church. And why? Well, it is 1968. And these two denominations found common ground theologically and hoped to set an example of church unity. Let that sink in for a moment. In a culture already divided over civil rights, desegregation, the church's debate over the role of women in the church and in the secular world, and the United Methodist Church envisioned itself as a big tent denomination, hoping to include all points of view and to unite in mission, and that was the background of the formation of the church that we call the United Methodist Church. Now, I quickly want to give you an overview of um, some of the things that have brought us to further conversation uh, around homosexuality or sexuality in the church, but I also want to make this point that Wesley um, had always stood for inclusion and human rights. This was a part of his ministry in England, and he wanted to be sure that we were providing humane conditions for the incarcerated, for example, and wanted to offer free and accessible education to children, as another example. And he advocated for the working poor and denounced slavery. These are some of the things that are a part of our background and who we are. The General Conference in 1968 was the organizing conference of the United Methodist Church. And the emphasis was on the celebration of our mission, the hope of strength in our global impact, the worship of God through song and the proclamation of God's word, and the vision of leading our country and world into faith in Jesus Christ. That was the first conference as a United Methodist Church. The second one, when the conference met again, was 1972. Why the gap? General conference meets every four years. And we'll go through these steps and what changed with each one. At, and you'll hear that they're four years apart, usually. Right? All right, in 1972, the topic of sexuality in the church was debated for the first time. In our book of discipline, how many of you have a book of discipline at home? Oh, no, do you really? No way! That is a first in my experience. Okay, this is a book of discipline. And in all of its many, many, many pages, there are many, many paragraphs that refer to the policies and, and procedures of the church. And they're amended through our general conference um, process every four years. More about that in a moment. Okay, in 1972, first time we've discussed the topic of sexuality in the church. Article 4 of our Constitution says, the United Methodist Church acknowledges that all persons are of sacred worth. All persons are of sacred worth. And it goes on to say, without regard to race, color, national origin, status, economic condition, shall be eligible to attend its worship services and participate in programs and receive the sacraments. Well, using that same language, pretty much, the social principles were drafted at that conference in 1972. And the social principles are guidelines. They express the theology and the hope that we have for living in a world where we're in community, family, um, church, and marketplace, all of our life together with other human beings 
and with the plant and animal world. I mean, we do, in our social principles, talk about how to live faithfully in the world that God has made. The social principles that were drafted in 1972 then, in the paragraph 161G, might be important to remember that one, says, all persons are individuals of sacred worth created in the image of God. All persons need the ministry of the church in their struggles for human fulfillment, as well as the spiritual and emotional care of a fellowship that enables reconciling relationships with God, with others, and with self. And this sentence was added in the debate from the floor. The UMC, United Methodist Church, does not condone the practice of homosexuality and considers this practice incompatible with Christian teaching. And that sentence is one that has carried forward to today. All of the um, words that I share with you are from that one section of the Book of Discipline, 1972. And I'll make sure that you know when uh, every time we gather for general conference and revise the Book of Discipline, um, pieces of legislation can be submitted from an individual, a congregation, a church council, a committee. And every single piece of legislation, every petition is read, reviewed, and considered for concurrence or non-concurrence by the voting body. We're talking thousands, <laughs> lots and lots of petitions. Um, and the one thing about social principles, as I said, this is a set of guidelines about what we believe and how we interact, how we live together in God's world. And I don't know that in the initial present presentation of the uh, social principles, they were ever intended to be law. And I say that because that's the way I've always understood it. Um, the general conference is made up of no more than a thousand delegates, half clergy, half our laity, and the body does function rather much like our legislative branch of government. And as we go through all of the um, items that are presented, and each one is considered, then it has an opportunity for debate on the floor and words can be voted up or down, and amendments are made, and after a while you say, what page are we on? <laughs> but there are a lot of elements to the process that I want you to know many, many, many different factors are at stake here and playing into the formation of this body of material. Okay, let's fast forward now to 1980. And the debate about homosexuality continued and the focus shifted then to marriage, adding that we affirm the sanctity of marriage, the marriage covenant, expressed in love, mutual support, personal commitment, and shared fidelity between a man and a woman. But in that same year, a new rule was debated and approved, adding this, limiting the funding of any gay caucus or group. So, if you wonder, how much money does the United Methodist Church send to uh, affirm, support the causes of the gay or lesbian or any other community related to sexuality? A round number. None. Because it's in the Book of Discipline that we do not support that. And this came again as a motion from the floor and was added to the Book of Discipline. Okay, let me go to 1984, four years later. And now a new um, sentence is added where we've previously had general statements, general meaning it applies to the church body, the congregation, as well as an annual conference. Now we hear um, sentences that are added and restrict, restrict clergy. For example, in 1984, clergy standards calling for ordination prohibited ordination for gay or lesbian pastors. Paragraph 304, 
calls for all who are ordained to serve as clergy and to maintain fidelity in marriage and celibacy in singleness. The next addition having to do with um, clergy prohibited the um, marriage of persons in same-sex union and added this. The practice of homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching, which we had seen before. Therefore, self-avowed practicing homosexuals are not to be certified as candidates, ordained as ministers, or appointed to serve in the United Methodist Church. And I think that sentence, again, is applied to the clergy and is never intended to say to a congregation, if you are a part of an LGBTQ community, you cannot come here. That's never been the intent. That has never been the intent. Uh, and I say that clearly because I think that when you read something that's as strongly worded as we have relative to the clergy, it's easy to understand, oh, well, that's a ban on all of it, and it's not intended to be that way. I want to move quickly now to say that typically the um, General Conference meets every four years. However, in 2016, where the debates had become very deeply divisive, the bishops asked if we might have a group, a commission on the way forward, looking at ways that we could uh, draft legislation and prepare for a future that might allow for those who wished an exit ramp and also allow for the remainder to live in unity with one another, whether there's agreement or not. And the commission's um, task was to bring it back to a special general conference in the year 2019, just three years later. 2019 general conference happened. 2020 did not. That's right. So just one year difference. But what they brought back, three proposals, and the one that passed is called the Traditionalist Plan, and it was the one that um, actually strengthened or um, made stronger restricting language uh, on the denomination's teaching on homosexuality, closing loopholes that they believed had allowed some who are LGBTQ persons to be ordained and to, to begin service in the church. And the plan that I'm describing here, the one that was approved in 2019, passed by 438 to 384. So the margin was slim, as it has been on a number of other matters. Um, I think at that point I can stop with the, uh, oh, I will add this. There was also a minimum penalty that was applied for clergy found guilty of performing a same-sex wedding. One year's suspension without pay for the first offense and a loss of credentials for the second. So it was a really strict penalty. Um, again, three plans were considered. That's the one that was approved. And as I uh, was introduced and you said I'd been to five conferences, I will tell you that I did. And they were between the years 1992, I attended one, 2000, 2004, 2008, and 2012. I was not at 2016 nor 19. But I do want to say that the privilege of attending is, well, it's indescribable, and it's challenging, and it's long hours, and, and a lot of things. And I don't know that we've ever created a perfect document this one's not perfect, um, but the process is one that's intended to be fair and democratic and allow for a lot of voices. What I also find interesting is that every time the book changes, um, you really do need a new copy because the subtleties of the language can mean a great deal. Um, as I turn this over to Tara, I do have a little bit more information if we have opportunities later for questions and answers, 
uh, that bring some of our discussions closer to home and what we've done in the North Carolina conference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carol. Thank you. Um, so, so real quick, uh, it's, as she mentioned, there are less than 1,000 delegates to General Conference. Our denomination has over 12 million members, so it's quite an honor to be elected to be a delegate uh, to General Conference. And so, um, you know, we, we really share in that honor that, that Carol has been elected time and time and time again. Our own Dick Morrison was also um, an alternate at the 2019, that very divisive General Conference, um, and, uh, and was there in St. Louis and um, out from the... Uh, Carol, of course, is clergy. Um, Dick was a voter on the laity side. And so, um, so anyway, um, you might want to, I'm, I'm just going to put Dick on the spot. You might want to grab him afterward to get his uh, impressions of, of what the 2019 General Conference was. Yeah, yeah okay. I'm now going to turn things over to Tara to explain sort of what has happened since 2019. Obviously, um, you know, some of this um, ha has been interrupted due to, due to COVID, but um, um, but yeah, t what, what, is, what is taking place now? <clears throat> thanks, Doug, um, and thanks for having me. Um, so in 2019, our, as um, Carol said, our Book of Discipline was upheld in its current configuration on homosexuality at the Special General Conference that year. Um, and in fact, um, that general conference only dealt with that matter that year. They didn't do any other pieces of legislation or business. And so if you remember the kinds of things that Carol mentioned, we uphold these matters about people, all people are of sacred worth and are equally valuable in the sight of God. Um, it also states we implore family and churches to not reject or condemn lesbian and gay members and friends. We commit ourselves to be in ministry with all persons. We do not allow any board, agency, committee, or council to give United Methodist funds to promote the acceptance of homosexuality or to violate the commitment of the United Methodist Church not to reject gay, lesbian members, and friends. We do not ordain self-avowed practicing homosexual persons. We do ordain non-practicing homosexual persons, which means this person is not in a same-sex marriage, domestic partnership, or civil union with another person. Clergy are not permitted to officiate same-sex weddings. So just to be really clear what our Book of Discipline says. Um, after this difficult gathering in 2019, where we uh, didn't offer answers to everything, and we didn't solve all the problems. There was a gathering of traditionalists, centralists, or centrists and progressives to share ideas on how our denomination could navigate this conflict. There were three two-day sessions which resulted in the protocol of reconciliation and grace through separation, a way to amicably separate as needed. Bishops and leaders of various agencies and groups representing all three areas, traditional, centrist, and progressive stances, signed this agreement. And yet, due to COVID, everything's due to COVID, right? The 2020 General Conference was postponed three times and now will not take place until 2024. Hopefully, right? This proposed legislation could only be presented for approval or rejection at a general conference. So even though there were people on board, officially as a body, it must become before a general conference. What did come out of that 2019 general conference was a new paragraph to assist congregations in leaving over matters of conscience in relation to the matter of homosexuality. It was added in 2019 with the anticipation of congregations wanting to leave following the 2020 General Conference, which is why this paragraph, which is known as 2553, was limited. There was no way to know we would have a pandemic in 2020, thereby pushing the General Conference dates back. So paragraph 2553 and the actions described there are effective through the end of 2023, which is now just the end of next year, 
because that was written into the paragraph at the time it was submitted and approved as a resolution by the 29 General Conference delegates. So 2553 is a paragraph that you might have read about, you might have heard about. It is the paragraph that we are, um, it is the means by which in the paragraphs 2553 is its designation that churches can leave over matters of conscience re relating to homosexuality. And so this is sort of where we are right now. Um, earlier this year, um, there, the bishop, the council of bishops and our bishop approved this paragraph as a way of going forward for congregations who had talked about it, some for years, some for months and months and months, and really were feeling like they didn't agree in some way, shape, or form. Um, there are actually quite a number of things going around in terms of how churches believe and what they've talked about. Some have done studies on human sexuality and they've had conversations and they've had small groups and they've had lots of ways to talk about this. And, um, you know, all of our own experiences creep into those conversations. So we come from so many backgrounds and we know so many different people and we've had so many different life experiences. And yet, through time and lots of effort, lots of prayer, congregations have come to a point where they feel that what they believe as a congregation, for the most part, does not fit or somehow does not match with the United Methodist Church. Now, the United Methodist Church um, voted on this traditional stance for uh, the Book of Discipline and maintain it, and yet we know we have always been what we call a big tent denomination where we don't all have to believe the same to worship together. If I started asking all of you what you believe right now, some of you would be surprised by maybe what your neighbor thinks about one thing or another, maybe sexuality, maybe some other thing, and yet You've worshipped together, you love each other, you've been neighbors on the pews, you've been in Sunday school classes together. And so, um, so the United Methodist Church continues to welcome all people and all our beliefs together um, in, one, in one big group. And yet there are those that are feeling like uh, they do not want to stay. So if I can, I'm just going to move to the process just a little bit. Um, what you've been hearing about is called the disaffiliation process, and it is on our conference website. If, if you have ever gone to the website, you just put in nccumc.org slash disaffiliation. You will get so much information. It will keep you reading for days, and, and it's very informative. It's well laid out. Um, you can see all the resources there. But it lays out a process for both the clergy and the churches of the United Methodist Church, and particularly our website is for the churches of the North Carolina Annual Conference. So uh, the three main things that you would probably hear about within the life of a church is first there is an inquiry process. Your church can, uh, in conversation with the pastor and the administrative council, uh, they can decide they want to inquire about what it would cost to leave the United Methodist Church. There is a cost, um, and it, the cost deals with um, what's written in our Book of Discipline and how, um, how this process was originally designated when you want to leave the denomination. You pay one... I always say, feel like I'm going to say this wrong, but you're paying the current year of apportionments, which apportionments are what we pay every year to, uh, we all pay into a pool so that this money can go out and be used missionally throughout the world. Your money here often goes to 
um, to Rotafunk or to people in other areas of the world. It goes to people right here in the Wilmington area. It goes to people in our conference and in our state. Um, and it's used in a variety of ways to support people in mission and ministry all throughout the world and throughout United Methodism as well. Um, so you would pay this year, and you would pay another of the same amount of, of the apportionment. So if it was $100 for one year, it'd be $100 again. It's a little more than $100, right? Um, and so, and so then... Of your annual budget, yeah. Right, it's about 10% of our annual budget. Roughly. So it's more than $100, but um, just trying to use round figures here. It's $100 once, $100 twice. And then there's this formula for configuring um, or figuring out pension liability. So your pastors have all been here, they've received pension and you know, you receive pension throughout your, your lifetime. And so we, it's a stock market value and then a, a large, you know, mathematical equation I can't do. But that would be figured out for you by the conference office and sent to you within two weeks of your inquiry. It doesn't enter the church into the process, but it does tell you how much money you would need to pay to be able to disaffiliate from the United Methodist Church. And the money is going to continue to fund the ministry and mission that the church is, that's so vital to our church and is very much part of who we are. So if all the churches dropped out without paying anything, it would, it would throw the budget out of whack and it would leave a lot of ministries with no money. And so this is really done as a support. It keeps, it keeps stability. It keeps stability for the pastoral pension, that sort of thing. Um, once you've done that, you can, that, you just have that figure to read unless you want to move forward with the pr process. Um, the next step is that the administrative council, because we are a representative sort of governing body, we have the administrative council who speaks on behalf of the church or makes, uh, helps, helps make rules in the life of the church on the local level and decide, make decisions. So the administrative council makes a decision on behalf of the congregation to decide where, whether there is adequate interest or not to move forward. And so after, you know, whether you all decide that you want study groups or prayer sessions or conversations, small groups, large groups, then at some point in time, your pastors and your administrative council would work together to decide, well, is this something that we believe the congregation wants to vote on? Are we, is there an interest in leaving the United Methodist Church? And so they would take a vote on that. And if they vote in the affirmative, then the church uh, could proceed with having a congregational vote. If they vote, uh, if they do not affirm that, then you would continue to be United Methodist and continue to move forward generally as you are. Um, if the council votes to move forward, then all the professing members do have an opportunity to vote. As the district superintendent, I would work with you and I would set a time for what's called a church conference, which is similar to your charge conference every year, except it would be about this one matter and every professing member, every full member of this church would have a vote. Um, so, and, and once that goes into motion, then you, after, after the signing of paperwork and of and a ratifying annual conference, you could be disaffiliated. And at that point, the church would be an independent church. They would be non-affiliated. And so that's what some of our churches are choosing to do. I know um, that it's not a simple majority um, that um, would true. win the vote with the, at the church conference. Could you speak to that? Sure. Uh, so the admin council votes on a simple majority that meaning, you know, 51% or whatever have to vote in the affirmative. At the, comp the church conference level, when the full congregation votes, it would need to be a two-thirds majority would need to vote in the affirmative to move forward to disaffiliate. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Do you want me to talk about trust? 
clause or no? Um, sure, that sounds great. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't want to. I don't want to leave Julia with no time. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's. Why don't we talk to Julia we and then we'll come back. Me. Okay. Um, and one of the things, Tara, I want to talk to you. Um, I want to come back to is. Okay, so what I heard from Carol is, is that what's in the Book of Discipline is a very um, a traditionalist um, plan around uh, uh, LGBTQ persons. Um, and yet what I'm hearing sort of in the, in the, in the world around me is that it's, it's conservative leaning or traditionalist leaning churches that want to leave. So why, why would traditionalist leaning churches leave if the plan that's in place is is traditionalist leaning. Um, so maybe you could um, help us with that. All right, let's turn to Julia. Julia, okay, so we heard from... from. <laughs> do, you, do you want to get that? For, that feels... Oh, do you, want, you want to come back to that right now? You want to. Okay. Well, they all have a little bit different reason. Um, do you want to break that down a little? I mean, do you want me to? So what, I, what I've heard, um, and, and this is just, you know, rumors in the atmosphere, right, <laughs> is that there have been occasions um, throughout the United States, um, I know that they happen extremely rarely, where um, a United Methodist pastor has performed a same-sex wedding, or there may be a conference that is a... Um, affirming um, someone toward ordination who is LGBTQ, um, and 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 I understand that uh, some folks feel that um, that the rules that have been put in place um, have not been um, consistently held from conference to conference, and therefore. Um, People are looking for something that's that's more consistent. So I may have gone ahead and answered my own question, but um, but maybe you want to add something to that, or maybe Carol would like to as well. Um, I think that is an additional concern that there has not been a consistent application of the rules in the Book of Discipline, and the inconsistency again, while rare. And while limited to certain places, it's not across the board, it's not all over the U.S., um, it's problematic for some who would prefer that to be a very consistent application of policy. Uh, that said, it is rare enough, and the people who are making those exceptions, the ones who are going ahead and, and doing what they feel as a matter of conscience they need to do, is um, making a statement that they believe to be also fair and appropriate for their situation. So I'm, I'm on the one hand saying I understand how people are uncomfortable with it's not being a consistently applied policy. I also understand from those who have stepped over the boundaries um, that this is what they feel they are led to do even by faith, literally by faith, I should say. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Yeah. Okay. I would agree, you know, I, I do think there are places where people are pushing the boundaries. Um, you know, with the, with the rise of social media and other, um, other things that give us instant access to videos or words that were said or written or shared, um, we're finding out about these things, but they tend to be partly you see them because they are somewhat sensational or sensationalized. Um, the things that are happening uh, with, with some clergy, I mean, you know, people do push the line sometimes and they tend to um, want to make a statement and that's who they are. But that is not by and large most of our pastors. As your district superintendent, I can tell you, I get calls, our pastor wore one black shoe and brown shoe. I think our pastor's losing it. I get calls for very little things. Our pastor wore their hair really weird today. What do you think that means? Um, I mean, I'm not kidding. I get all kinds of uh, sort of backlash. So I do believe that if your pastor 
whether you attend Wrightsville or any other church, if your pastor said something that was very, uh, very off base, that didn't seem to have something to do with the Bible or against the Bible or something like that, I assure you, someone would call me. <laughs> Probably many someones, and I, I don't say that as a joke. I just say, you know, you all are here because you share a belief and a life together. You are a church family. You love one another. That's what you tell me when I meet with you is that I come here because my family brought me or a friend brought me, and these people became family to me. And so you care about each other and you care about your leaders and the things they say and how they treat you. And, you know, if, if something goes very awry, you tell your district superintendent about it. And we work with the pastors. We also sometimes have to say to the pastors, we're going to have to have a process to work this out. Um, and certainly, if there was something egregious, you know, we would, we would follow what needs to be done, and that's what we have done in the past, we'll do in the future. In these cases where there are some alternate decisions being made, uh, there is a reason behind that. The bishop in that area, the district superintendent in that area, they have their reasons and they're working through it. Um, I don't think their intention is to just anything goes. It's not throw the book of discipline out the window. Um, and I think that's, that's important to note. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Let's turn things over to Pastor Julia. Um, so um, both uh, Reverend Carol and Reverend Tara both grew up um, in the Methodist Church. Um, Pastor Julia did not. You had a different experience, and you were drawn to the United Methodist Church. And so I wanted to get a, a little bit of a feel of, um, from you, what does is, what is the Methodist Church mean to you? Why were you drawn to this, and, and sort of what do you see in the future as a, a young, promising clergy person. Yeah. Um, so can you all see me from here? I was, okay, this feels more casual. No? I heard a, I heard a no. Okay, I'll stand up then. So um, I was raised in the Episcopal Church. My grandpa was actually um, Episcopal clergy. Um, and I grew up going to church every week and, you know, was always in Sunday school and in retrospect, being very difficult by asking very difficult questions to my poor Sunday school teachers. Um, and always had a lot of spiritual curiosity um, for reasons with, with my family and just kind of where we were. Um, when I was in about middle school, my family partially started to attend a Methodist church. Um, my dad had been raised Methodist. Um, and I was very suspicious <laughs> of the Methodists, to be honest. I was like, there's a guitar. I don't know what, what any of this means. Um, and they prayed without a prayer book, and that was very bizarre for me also. I had never seen that. Um, so it was in this Methodist church that I ended up um, having really what I, I consider to be a conversion experience. I've always been a Christian, but um, developed a personal relationship with God and really... Um, came alive to the work that God was doing in my life. And that happened at a United Methodist summer camp. Um, so already kind of United Methodism kind of became my default in a sense. Um, but I didn't know. Um, I ended up going to college at a formerly Baptist college, uh, Belmont University, which had recently disaffiliated from the Baptist church, but like had those Baptist roots very strongly. Um, and my first year, I was a biblical studies major, and I knew that I was called to ministry, um, felt the call to ministry when I was 16. It's another story for another time. Um, and I started exploring different denominations and, and different groups. Um, I went to a lot of non-denominational churches. Um, I was drawn to kind of the fire and passion that I saw there. Um, I went to a Pentecostal church for a little bit. Um, I mean, I was all over the place. Um, and eventually, what brought me to the Methodist church was um, partially I kind of got pushed in because I um, asked God um, where I was praying about where I was meant to be in ministry, and a job, I mean, truly fell from fell from heaven to be a United Methodist youth pastor. And it was like, well, that was pretty clear. And um, the more I learned, though, the more that this made sense. Um, for one sense, it, thinking about ministry, um, you know, I could see the allure of this sort of non-denominational thing. Like, 
what if I could just be in charge and it's up to me and I just get to get up and preach every week and not worry about any of these systems and this book and all of that. Um, but I also realized that there would be no one out there who, was, who I was accountable to. Um, and part of the reason I chose the United Methodist Church is the levels of accountability um, that I felt like, you know, I, I'm less likely to get out of control as a leader um, if there's really good people, if there's, you know, a district superintendent like Tara Lane who's, who's calling me and can say, uh, what was that about, you know? Um, so that was part of it for me. Um, I also loved the structure that I wouldn't be just some solo person in the world trying to do ministry, but I'd have all of these colleagues together in the United Methodist family. The more that I learned about United Methodist beliefs, the more I said, oh my gosh, I didn't even realize that this is exactly what I believe. Um, I've said that I've always felt like I'm either the most conservative or the most progressive person in a room. <laughs> and in the United Methodist Church, I found a denomination that is willing to hold things together. Um, so a deep, deep evangelical spirit, um, a desire for people to come to know the saving power of Jesus Christ, and also realizing um, that we're called to be at work in the world and um, serving others and seeking justice and changing the world that we're part of the kingdom coming. Um, I saw all of these different things held together. And I loved, too, that I saw people with very different opinions on theological issues and political issues and all kinds of issues who were managing to stay together and worship together. Um, that has continued to be one of the most amazing things to me about the United Methodist Church is that, that I see people who, who hold very different beliefs respecting each other and, and seeking to do the mission together. So um, that's it. The other thing is um, coming from the Episcopal tradition, that's actually the same tradition that John Wesley uh, came out of. They were Anglican priests, um, but they wanted more of the fire and the spirit and the heart. Um, and that's exactly how I felt um, when my Episcopal grandmother was, um, you know, she, she always tells me, well, John Wesley died an Anglican, you know, all of that. But, but I've said that I, I feel a similarity to that sense of I want this really great theology, right? This intellectualism and these creeds and the tradition that goes back 2,000 years that's grounded in that way. And I want my heart to be on fire for Jesus. Um, and I believe the Methodist Church is what that is. Um, and I'll say to your question about um, kind of the future, it has been so fun and weird um, being a person pursuing a call to ministry in the United Methodist Church in this time. I mean, all the time, me and um, my fellow colleagues, even at Duke, where there's a lot of Methodists, but there's also a lot of people who aren't Methodists, they would just be like, why are you doing this? <laughs> you know, why would you be giving your life and going through a whole lot of hoops. Y'all, the ordination process is not easy. Um, why would you go through all this, you know, when I could go, go to a non-denominational church and be ordained today? Um, and there is this deep and abiding hope, I think, that um, the, the pastors of my generation know that this is, this is the church that's raised us, and we're not, we're not giving up the ship, you know? Um, and we feel that we owe so much of our own, I'm gonna cry here, so much of our own faith journeys to the generations before us that were in the United Methodist Church that raised us, that, that grew us, that taught us in Sunday school, that, um, you know, I was thinking about what those apportionments do. Part of what those apportionments do is paid for my education. I mean, like, we've been raised by this giant global church, and we're gonna see it through. Um, and it's really hard, and yeah, it would probably be easier to go somewhere else, but there's things that are worth fighting for, and I think for those of us who are young United Methodist clergy, um, the United Methodist Church is one of those things. Thanks, Julia. Appreciate that. <laughs> so... Uh, Midweek, we sent out an e-blast um, asking people to, um, to send in questions ahead of time for tonight, and we got several of those, and so I wanted to, um, to share those um, with the panel. Um, uh, 
Pastor Julia has seen these, but the others have not. And so anyway, um, the first issue we got was, um, when is the decision going to be made by the United Methodist Church, and does each church um, have to vote on this issue? Um, Tara, do you want to take that one? And make a decision about what? About whether or not we're... Uh, whether, I, I <laughs> guess they, they mean specifically around um, whether we're... I, I don't know, because um, like, the person's not here, but... Um, <laughs> I believe, if I may, having yeah. seen the context of the email that that question was in, I believe that the question was around um, homosexuality. When will a, a decision, I think, be made in the denomination and do individual churches need to vote on what they feel is, is correct? Well, so the, nec <clears throat> the next time that we meet in 2024, I believe that there will, that will be addressed. I mean, it will certainly come up in some form or fashion. We don't have, um, I don't know of all the submissions that will come into the 2024 General Conference at this time, but I am assuming there will be some questions there. There have been folks that have been pushing to, to change language, you know, a word here and there that changes the, the way the discipline reads a bit. Um, I don't have that answer, but I would think at 2024 there would be something that changes. I don't know that. Uh, I do think there will still be a way to disaffiliate from the United Methodist Church at that point as well. It may look a bit different than 2553 that we have right now, but I think there would be an ability to do that. Now, whether or not every church needs to take a vote, it, might, it will probably depend on, it will probably just be up to each local church and how that's structured at uh, that time. Yeah, okay. Um, one thing I want to make sure that we get across, though, is that we don't have to vote at all. Right now, you don't have to vote at all. To yeah. be United Methodist and continue to do doing what you do and having your church as it is, you don't have to do anything. You just keep trucking. Right. <laughs> if, if we think there were two-thirds of the church that wanted to disaffiliate, then we would consider... Yeah, if you thought it was a significant... Um, question here, you, you could go forward, but you don't have to. But we don't have to. You don't have yeah, to. You don't have to, you don't have to vote. Correct. Okay, thanks. Um, the next question... Can I, can I yeah. add one, one thing to that? Yeah. Um, something that I, I think is important to communicate is that what's happening right now, you might be hearing from other churches about votes and things. These are not position statements. This is not a vote on whether or not uh, a church um, approves of same-sex relationships. Um, this is a vote about whether or not to disaffiliate from the United Methodist Church. Um, so there's no pressure. It's not like by not taking a vote, we're making a statement or anything like that. Um, it's just, it is only a question of whether at this time you want to disaffiliate from the United Methodist Church. Thank you. That's extremely helpful. Yeah, very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Ask that again. So, I, Julie, the, the way you asked, said mm -hmm. that made me, I just made the question. So is that because churches now, the votes they're taking are just trying to go ahead and affirm that they have a position? No. 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 Okay. Mm -hmm. no. Um, just the opposite. There, there, are, um, there are no votes that are being taken to affirm or, um, or disavow same-sex weddings or LGBT inclusion in the church or ordination, the votes that are being taken are whether or not you want to leave the United Methodist Church. So as she was making the case, that we're, not make, we're not voting on position statements. What churches are voting on is whether or not to leave the United Methodist Church or not. Okay? All right. Um, Dale, do you have a follow-up to that specific
um, you know, that, that may be, you know, among, among your friends, uh, you know, or other, other groups uh, may, have, may have similar um, opinions to that. Uh, Tara and I were at that disaffiliation meeting. She ran the meeting. Um, you know, I, I don't know that we need to talk about other churches um, specifically, but if there's something you want to address. Well, just generally in other churches, um, I, I think from person to person, it probably differs. Um, you know, some of this comes around compatibility, um, and I don't know if we want to get into that, but if you're if you're compatible, no, I think this is a great thing to talk about. Right. Yeah, if you're if you're compatible, it means that um, David and I can believe different things, but we're compatible enough to worship together and to move on together and be in a church family together. But some people are finding they're incompatible. They're incompatible compatible with what the United Methodist Church is doing, saying, believing. <laughs> Whatever it is, it might be one thing, but they're pulling that thing out and saying, I just can't live with that one thing anymore, so I'm out. Um, and, I mean, that's, you know, as a church, if they've decided that they want to do that, or if there are people say, well, I don't really have a problem with the sexuality, but I will vote on this because I think we should leave, then, you know, I'm not, we're not polling them individually. We're polling them as a church, and it's based it's simply one question: Do you want? Do you approve disaffiliation or not approve disaffiliation? So it sort of comes down to that one part. Thanks, Tara. Okay. Um, I, we've reached an hour. I've clearly underestimated um, how long we needed um, for uh, tonight's gathering. Um, but uh, so we'll take uh, just a couple more questions, if that's okay. Um, everybody okay to stay? Just a few more minutes. Yeah. The panelists are saying they're okay. Okay. Yeah, Dick. No. Um, not, yeah. Um, Carol, you, you want to address that? I think it's, you, you, you're on the right track. That's right. And you're well informed. <laughs> you're well informed about um, some of the players in this conversation. Um, it goes more to what Dale said that in some churches, there's a feeling of incompatibility. We can no longer support the trend that we see towards more progressive leaning churches. And all along though, all along when uh, an exit ramp, a uh, disaffiliation paragraph was discussed, it was a question, really never understood exactly, who will leave? And we really didn't know. And as it came down to the delays of the general conference. Um, I think some congregations and some pastors and some individuals, I can't generalize totally, but some said, I'm tired of waiting. I feel like these issues are getting stronger in terms of the division, stronger um, in dividing us. And so a new denomination was conceived, announced, and um, some churches are beginning to disaffiliate to join another denomination. In fact, though, the African bishops, speaking for their congregations, said they do not want to disaffiliate. They want to remain part of the United Methodist Church, and part of the reasons they cited are, again, what Julia, Tara, what all of us could probably say, we're stronger together in mission. And as long as we're focused on mission, serving, and knowing Jesus Christ is Lord, that is enough to hold us together 
for the sake of a greater cause. So what, like the press release, one follow-up question. Okay. It sounds to me like you're saying that the selected churches that are, that are very interested in starting to vote to leave are the ones who would like to be more progressive, more the other way around. Yeah. Other way around. It was the other way around. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Ivan, what, what's your question? It, it seems somewhat ironic to me that the traditional churches are the ones who are leaving, and yet they have to discipline presumably the way they want it. The flip side of that is that until 2024, we don't know what the discipline is going to read. And, and while we see the handwriting from 2019, which was somewhat um, of an upheaval, uh, it, it could be that the discipline has changed. Who knows that? toward the progressives, or, or toward a centrist position. And so I'm, I'm confused about churches who are making this decision in advance before 2024. I understand that their consternation about the pandemic and the delay. What I don't understand is making a decision before you know what your very discipline is going to say. Great, great, I agree. great statement. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just want to know what people are meaning um, okay, Martha's asking, what do people mean when we use the word progressive? Um, and maybe we should say it as well as traditionalist. Julia, yeah. you want to take that okay. one? Yeah, sure. The other thing is I'd love to, to share a little bit about, we've thrown around the compatibilist thing, and I think I'm, I'm going to ex explain this in a, in a sort of a spectrum. Okay, I'll, I'll stand up. Okay, so on the issue specifically of homosexuality. Okay, so let's see. This is, I'll do it left and right. Okay, so on the, let's start on the conservative side. Okay, on the far right, you have people who are traditional non-compatibilists. So these are people who are, have a, what would we would call a traditional view on homosexuality. So they say that homosexuality is a practice um, that is morally wrong and that God does not ordain. Um, and this is so central um, that this is what um, kind of our, our faith needs right now. Um, what's going to kind of separate us, right, is this, wh where we stand on this. And so they say we don't want to be a part of any church that would um, not have this strong position, right? And I'll say, you know, this group, they're very concerned about how we read the Bible and whether we're taking God's word seriously. And, you know, one of the things that I'm sad that this group is leaving is I, I appreciate that they have, you know, really, really challenged everyone what is what does scripture say. So that's that. Okay. That's traditional non compatibilists. Traditional non compatibilists. Then you have traditional compatibilists who say, I think that homosexuality isn't God's best for the world. And I don't think that is, um, you know, that same-sex couples are living within God's will. But I'm willing to be in a church with people who disagree with me. And I'm willing to be in ministry with people who don't have the same perspective um, because I, I'm going to choose that something else is more important. Um, then you have um, progressive compatibilists who say, um, I think a lot of times once you move over to the progressive side, it stops being about a practice and starts being about um, identity, that someone is inherently, um, that their sexual identity is part of who they are, um, and that, that God has uh, no problem with someone who is attracted to someone of the same sex. And so they are progressive, would be that standpoint. But compatibilists still, so that they would say, but you know what? I can absolutely still worship with people who don't agree with me on this. Then you have progressive non-compatibilists who would say this is a justice issue, this is an issue of inclusion, and it, it absolutely has to be that everybody needs to be supportive. And if they're not, I can't be a part of it. This group over here, the progressive or the traditional non-compatibilists, are the ones who have started the movement to exit, thereby leaving most likely 
um, mostly people who are compatibilists. David, you want to follow up question? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Julia. That was helpful. One other point is there are some people on the progressive not compatibilists who are yes. leaving also. Churches yes, that. yeah, yeah, that's so true. Actually, yeah. Yeah, church is leaving on mm -hmm. um, um, far spectrum. Yeah. So, That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so, yeah, so we have people on the, the most people in our area are probably more the traditional non compatibilists but we do have progressive non compatibilists that have already left, uh, left some time before. And we're talking, when we say leaving, we mean churches. But we, we, we mean disaffiliating as a church. As a church member, obviously, church members leave when they need to. You know, sometimes church members leave because they need to go somewhere that is more aligned with who they are. And that does change from time to time. So we're, but we're talking about, when we say leaving, we're mostly talking about churches have finally made decisions as a congregation to disaffiliate from both ends. The compatibilist are sort of holding together, and then we talk about them being more centrist or being have a centrist interest anyway to stay together, to continue to worship as a family together. Any idea as to sort of nationwide how many churches we're expecting to disaffiliate? Per year? You might have. I, I don't know per year, no. The initial number and I can only give you percentages, is less than 10%. Mm -hmm. and, and that would be reflected, I think, in most of our graphs of a spectrum. The extreme one side and the extreme other side, leading that effort, and it would be 10% or less nationwide. In the Southeast, you would expect maybe more. And in the North Carolina conference in this first year of voting before the end of the calendar year, so that their disaffiliation could be recognized and approved, checked off at annual <coughs> conference. In our conference, the percentages don't look like they'd be even 10%. However, we have another year to go. And so that's why I was asking if we're looking at an annual rate or cumulative. Mm -hmm. David. It also may be noted that we have 33,000 United Methodist churches yeah, there are more United Methodist churches than our post offices in America. There, there are more United Methodist churches than our McDonald's. I mean, seriously, that's true. Yeah. Um, so, um, all right, maybe, um, maybe one or two more questions. Okay. And then we'll call it a night. I don't see any questions. Okay. I'll go to, oh, Dale. Okay. Okay. All right. Dale's got a great question. He said he thinks he'd always heard that um, that the property is held by the, the conference of the United Methodist Church. So um, he was he thought it was um, strange to hear that uh, that the cost was not necessarily related to the property. Tara's right. going to handle that one. So the church holds the property in trust for the conference. There's what's called a trust clause at every United Methodist Church. And this it's harkens back to, yeah, it's in the Book of Discipline, and it harkens back to the 18th century <laughs> from when we were created, I mean, when John Wesley was around and all these things. It was called the Model Deed or something to begin with, but now it's called the Trust. And we were the first church denomination to ever have it, and other denominations have modeled this Trust law off of ours. So it's been in place a really, really, really long time. And um, so what it means that the church holds it in trust for the conference is that you have the deed, you hold this deed, but in essence, if you are a United Methodist Church, if you have a cross and flame, if you've ever said we wanted to be United Methodist, this is written in there. Whether you wrote it in, you saw it, you intuited it, it's there by law uh, that this, this is a trust. Um, there. So our bishop and our, uh, well, our trustees and the cabinet, we all conferred 
and the trustees, when they wrote up the disaffiliation agreement for the United Methodist Churches in North Carolina, said, we'll continue to be gracious, as God has been gracious, and we will not charge any money, we will not ask for any percentage of the value of your land and your buildings and your property to take it with you. So it's the two years of apportionments, like I mentioned, and the pension liability, but zero for the property. And that was just a gracious offer by our trustees, and it's written into the legal document that we call the disaffiliation agreement. All right, and that's, that's not the same in every conference. No. So if you've got friends or family in another conference, they may, they may have different rules around that. Um, but, uh, okay, so, so if we don't own the property, um, does that mean that we can't do anything we want with the property? You, you can do all the things that you've ever wanted to do. You can pave your parking lot or you can make it a gravel. You can knock a building down. You can build a building up. You can remodel. You can do all the things that you've always done with your property. Um, there's no restriction on that. I mean, other than it, it's approved by a district church and building committee, you submit it to them to make sure you're not, you know, I don't know, building an Empire State Building where it doesn't belong or something. But, uh, yeah, there, you can still do all the things. You can change the color of your carpet. You can do all the things that you've done before. Uh, you don't have to own it to do those things. Really, the only thing we couldn't do is change to another denomination without first going through this, this process. Correct. Yeah, okay. All right, um, I saw a question down here. I've heard from I've David a couple of times. One observation on the trust clause would be that it, if uh, conference or the Board of Missions has a lien on, on the property, then that would have to be paid first yes. before they can leave. It is yeah, sure. true. Sometimes there are loans that are given out that don't have to be paid back unless you leave the denomination, and those have to be paid back as well. Okay. I think it's all a question down here. No? Okay. Yeah, you missed the one back here in the back. Okay, I'm sorry. Sarah? Yeah. Yeah, first of all, how long will you leave the Dustin's church? Um, Would you have some time after this? Forever. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so the question, in case you didn't hear in the back, is how long will I be at the church? Um, she's a longtime Methodist, and she knows that they, they move pastors from time to time. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll take that. I'll give that to the district superintendent who makes it. <laughs> if he flies straight. This is a, that's, that's a great, great question. Those are two different questions. So, um, so the second question is, she was just reading Romans and, and saw um, some, uh, um, some, some words about homosexuality in, in the first chapter of Romans. And so, um, in fact, that's related to one of the questions that came online. So Tara, why don't you handle the, um, the appointment question and then uh, Julia, our... Um, who uh, majored in biblical studies and biblical languages will handle the uh, the, the really easy question on, uh, in the on biblical interpretation. I don't care what you think about the Great, great, great point. Thanks, thanks for that. So uh, we'll, we'll respond to that in just a second. Okay, let's do the appointments. Okay, um, appointments. Because I'd love to know how much. <laughs> what did you love to know? Tara, do you um, want to do me while you're at it too? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so David, Julia, and Doug, the plan is this. So, um, appointments are always made for, well, we seek to make them one year at a time. So your pastors are reappointed every year, uh, sometimes to the same place, and then occasionally you'll get a new pastor, and, they'll, and a new one will come here, and one of these will go there. 
Um, so we don't have any time limits. There's no restriction on how long you can stay. I think Ray Gooch just uh, retired after, what, 35 years at one appointment? Um, and, and, and sometimes people stay one year. Um, so there are like zero plans. We haven't met about any appointments yet, so I can't say, but I am married to your pastor and I like it here. <laughs> um, so, I mean, it really will be determined in, in consultation with the full cabinet about the needs that are there, but we don't seek to move people any more often than we have to um, based on the need of the church the needs of other churches and how best to fill them. It really is. It really is a well thought out and well weighed decision and prayed over as well. All right. Thank you for that. And then, so Julia, you want to talk about the biblical interpretation question? I would yeah. love. I would love to. I'll okay. try and make it speedy. Um, okay. Got the Bible with me. Okay. First off, um, I want to say I love that you are asking these questions because scripture is so, so, so important. And if we, we don't have the rock of scripture to, to build ourselves on, then, then there, there's no, I mean, that's what makes Christians, right? One of the things. So um, first off, that's great. The other thing is um, we only have a limited amount of time, but I would love nothing more than to talk to you or anyone here about the interpretation of scripture and have a longer conversation about this. There is even a QR code on my door. You can scan and make an appointment with me. I'd love to talk to you. Okay, now, let's do this. So, what I believe the, the passage you're referencing is in Romans 1, starting verse 24. Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity and to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Is that just to make sure? wonderful. I love how you talked about the faith of a child, and that, that's really great. So the thing is that, that the reality is, y'all, I love this book. I love the Bible. And it is also really complicated, and it's really messy. And the, the reality is, that I don't say this to try to be a controversial <clears throat> statement. I say this to be a statement of fact, is there's things that feel like, like they, don't, they don't mesh, you know? Um, between the Old Testament and the New Testament, or, you know, and when you look at the whole big sweep, it makes sense. But if you're pulling things, it, I, I think that it's it's complicated that, that hmm, I, no, 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 I know, I know. Um, so I think what's important is that in the United Methodist Church, we've talked about the fact that we bring ourselves to Scripture and we ask for God to give us wisdom about what things mean. And we also know that it's important oftentimes to take into account the, the original context that these things were written, not as a way to diminish the power, but actually to give voice to the fact. One of my favorite sayings is that the, the scripture is the word of God in the same way that Jesus is the word of God, right? So Jesus is fully divine and fully human. And the humanity doesn't take away from the divinity, and the divinity doesn't take away from the humanity. And I believe the same is true about the, about scripture, is that it is equally of, of humans and of God, and that the divinity doesn't take away from the humanity, the humanity doesn't take away from the divinity, right? So sometimes context can be really helpful. Um, so I'll tell you from my study in Romans and biblical languages that, that the concept of a 
homosexual relationship as we have it today, um, a relationship between two equal partners in a committed monogamous relationship um, did not exist in, in this worldview. Um, there was a lot of, of practices of men having sex with men, um, and it was particularly happening with older men in positions of power who would have a slave boy or, um, or even like um, an apprentice in their business that, that they would assault. Um, and I, I realize that that's a little, that's a little graphic, but that, that is the context that we're writing about. And, and there's a whole host of things that are wrong with that situation that are not necessarily true about um, a committed relationship between two individuals. Um, I think there's absolutely room to disagree. I'm just trying to, to show you why people might have a different perspective. The other thing that um, people often look towards is the overall sweep of um, scripture. You know, you you mentioned that that it's you know we it, it, there shouldn't be any controversy, and I think that'd be great. But I also know that um, that there's also places here in the New Testament that say that I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing right now, right? That women shouldn't be speaking in church. Um, and I, I had to wrestle through that myself. I went through a phase where I was going, you know, am I kidding myself that I'm called to ministry? And at the end of the day, I knew that I could see the sweep of the story. And more than that, I knew deeply and passionately that God was at work in my life and was calling me to this. Um, and so I was able to say, I think in this moment, through the discernment of the Holy Spirit, that greater narrative and the work that God is doing in my heart right now is, is enough that I'm going to say I don't fully understand in this moment how that works with, with what Paul wrote in these letters, but I know what God's doing in my life. And, and I'll say that for me, I had a similar experience when it came to um, the issue of homosexuality, which was, um, and I think, I think absolutely that there is, it, it's not a all things go <laughs> situation. Just believe. It, it, it all comes to me. I swear. I've got one more passion in my And I mean, we, this is a whole year I've been alone. Yeah. I've been mean, under the past 40 years. Yeah. That I've been studying and fighting through all these years of living. <laughs> but I understand my whole thing is I don't understand the controversy about anything if we believe God can. It, I think that's great. It feels like maybe I'd love to have a conversation more with you one-on-one -on -one about that, but I would say overall to, to try to bring us home is that um, I think when we read scripture, it can feel really, really obvious what it means and what we should do. Um, and if going to a Bible college um, and then seminary um, taught me anything, it's that um, I think if you handed every single person in this room, even, a Bible and read the same passage, everyone would have something different that stood out to them and that felt obvious. And that's why I love studying scripture with people, because, you know, I can read Romans 57 times and then someone else says, well, I see this, and I go, I've never seen that before. And because the word, we, we deal with the difficulty of the fact that, as Hebrews says, the word of God is alive and active and sharper than any double-edged sword. And so people respond based on where they are to scripture differently. So even though it can feel really cut and dry to us, I would say let's try really hard to have um, charity for people who, who are reading, feel like they're reading something different. Um, and let's open that conversation up. Thanks, Julia. And yeah. if you want to wrestle with the scriptures with Julia, she's teaching disciple tomorrow night. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, it's nine o'clock, and uh, and I appreciate everybody sticking around for so long. Let's uh, let's give our panelists a big hand. Thank you all for being here. Thank y'all for your faithful questions. Um, we'll stick around for a few minutes. If anybody wants to ask us something individually, um, let's close with a moment of prayer.
Holy God, we know that we don't all agree, and we continue to wrestle with your word and understanding it. Father, I pray that you will um, continue to speak to us, and Lord, that, um, that we, would, um, we would do what is faithful in your eyes. Um, Lord, help us to live together as a church, even when we disagree, and, um, and help us um, to, to continue to share the good news of Jesus Christ with the world in need. Um, I ask all of this in Jesus' most holy and sacred name. Amen. All right, thanks everybody. Like I said, we'll stick around. Y'all have a great night.